Lord be with you and also with you. Today we're going to think about the face of Jesus as we anticipate by a few days the Feast of the Transfiguration. We shall hear that the face of Jesus was transfigured, changed, metamorphosed, and that his followers saw his glory revealed. This raises the immediate question, what did Jesus look like? <clears throat> of course, we never learn anything about his appearance in the Gospels. There's not even a hint there or anywhere else. Eventually, it became widely accepted that Jesus was a pale-faced man, surprisingly given his origins, with an auburn beard and long hair. This convention is so widely accepted that we can easily recognize the image of, of Jesus and we find it very difficult to think of him in any other way. It's the face that looks down on this church from the, the great east window that was created by the Victorians. We don't know what Jesus looked like and that doesn't really matter. What does matter is that we have imagined and tacitly accepted a certain type of face that looks more like some of us than others. This runs the danger of conforming our saviour to our image rather than conforming ourselves to his. We're going now to resolve once more to put behind us all that is wrong by calling to mind and confessing our sins and we shall then hear words of forgiveness let us pray god of mercy we acknowledge that we are all sinners we turn from the wrong that we have thought and said and done and are mindful of all that we have failed to do. For the sake of Jesus, who died for us, forgive us all that is past, and help us to live each day in the light of Christ our Lord. Amen. May the God of love bring us back to himself, forgive us our sins, and assure us of his eternal love, in Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. We sing our opening hymn, All for Jesus. reading from Exodus. Now Moses used to take the tent and pitch it outside the camp, far off from the camp. He called it the tent of meeting. And everyone who sought the Lord would go out to the tent of meeting, which was outside the camp. 
Whenever Moses went out to the tent, all the people would rise and stand, each of them at the entrance of their tents, and watch Moses until he'd gone into the tent. When Moses entered the tent, the pillar of cloud would descend and stand at the entrance of the tent, and the Lord would speak to Moses. When all the people saw the pillar of cloud standing at the entrance of the tent, all the people would rise and bow down, all of them at the entrance of their tents. Thus the Lord used to speak to Moses face to face as one speaks to a friend. There is something at once intimate and daring about this description. The Lord speaks to Moses face to face in the privacy and shelter of a tent. This is surely prayer in a setting so trusting and intimate that it is positively domestic. But how daring to use the phrase face to face for what can the face of the Lord be? There is no answer to that, but we know what it conveys. We might not know what the Lord's face looks like, but each of us knows what our own face looks like. After all, we live in a world of reflective surfaces. And to everyone who is worshipping today, I say you should know that your face is a thing of endless fascination and beauty. Your face brings together all your senses in one place, ready to engage with the world around you. With the different parts of your face, you can see and hear, taste and smell, and even touch that which is around you. Your face receives information, but it also gives information. It communicates constantly through voice and expression. It's the range of human expression that makes faces so fascinating. We study each other's faces to learn what is going on inside, because the face betrays true feeling. We spend years trying to control the information our faces give out, but it is to no avail. We don't know what Jesus looked like, but we do know that he engaged with the world around him through his senses. He looked at Peter. He heard cries for help. He tasted fish and bread. He smelled the fragrance of the perfume that filled the house, and he received the kiss of Judas.
a reading from the book of Genesis. Jacob has wrestled with a mysterious man at the ford of Jabbok. Then the man said, let me go for the day is breaking. But Jacob said, I will not let you go unless you bless me. So he said to him, what is your name? And he said, Jacob. Then the man said, you shall no longer be called Jacob, but Israel. For you have striven with God and with humans and have prevailed. Then Jacob asked him, Please tell me your name. But he said, Why is it that you ask my name? And there he blessed him. So Jacob called the place Peniel, saying, For I have seen God face to face, and yet my life is preserved. The human face, every human face, is a thing of beauty, especially yours. There are younger faces and older faces, just as wines can be fresh and fruity and animated, or mature and characterful and complex. The things we can do with those 43 or so muscles and all those little or not so little wrinkles. Each face is a shop front, revealing the things that lie within. All are things of beauty that can be studied at length. In a time of pandemic, we have experienced a series of challenging restrictions in order to maintain the safety of the whole community. We have to remember that we are part of a worldwide effort to control the suffering and loss of life. But the reality has been a huge amount of hardship for us all in many different forms. The latest has been the increasing requirement to cover our faces. There are worse things happening and we are all knuckling down and getting on with it. But this one is grim on a human scale. Gone is much of our delight in the human interaction that comes from face to face with others. Like Jacob at the ford of Jabbok, we are deprived of all the clues to human feeling, emotion, depth that come from reading faces. Winking and thumbs upping can't really do the job of the reassuring smile. The hidden face is a real challenge for us all. Our next hymn will be led by the Alexander family. Thank you. 
A reading from Luke. Now about eight days after these sayings, Jesus took with him Peter and John and James and went up on the mountain to pray. And while he was praying, the appearance of his face changed and his clothes became dazzling white. Suddenly they saw two men, Moses and Elijah, talking to him. They appeared in glory and were speaking of his departure, which he was about to accomplish at Jerusalem. Now Peter and his companions were weighed down with sleep, but since they had stayed awake, they saw his glory and the two men who stood with him. Just as they were leaving, Peter said to Jesus, Master, it is good for us to be here. Let us make three dwellings, one for you, one for Moses, and one for Elijah, not knowing what he'd said. While he was saying this, a cloud came and overshadowed them, and they were terrified as they entered the cloud. When the cloud came, a voice that said, This is my son, my chosen, listen to him. When the voice had spoken, Jesus was found alone. And they kept silent, and in those days told no one any of the things they had seen. There's a beautiful little phrase in the first book of Samuel that goes thus. The Lord does not see as mortals see. They look on the outward appearance, but the Lord looks on the heart. On similar lines, we might say, don't judge a book by its cover. The beauty and the fascination inherent in every face doesn't necessarily tell us about what lies within. We read a face and we pick up clues about the sort of person before us, but we should be wary of drawing conclusions and of making wider judgments. I suppose we can't help being more or less trusting of a person depending on what our eyes tell us. But the lesson must be to treat all people as people, as people who matter, who should be heard and treated with courtesy. There's a strong Christian tradition drawn from Matthew 25 of treating all people as Christ. This can be hard, and we can also remember that we are told to be both wise as serpents and innocent as doves. We can draw on our experience to be wary, but never prejudiced. All will one day be revealed, just as the followers of Jesus had that extraordinary and well-attested experience of Christ Jesus transfigured his face changed, we are told. They saw him for a moment as he was. For a moment, all their misunderstandings were swept away and they recognized his glory. They saw things as they really were. People are beautiful, but so much gets in the way. Our sin, mistrust, aggression, prejudice. It's like we're all wearing masks that hide our true selves from each other. Not the sensible but testing masks of the pandemic, but the masks that stop us seeing each other as truly human, that stop us discerning Christ's likeness in all his children. Let us pray for the day when we will no longer see as in a mirror dimly, but face to face with our neighbour and with God, as one speaks with a friend. Let us pray. Holy God, we see your glory in the face of Jesus Christ. May we, your people, reflect his life in word and deed that all the world may know his power to change and save. This we ask through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen.
And now we continue in prayer, prayer for our own needs and for the needs of others. We pray, Lord God, for your church in all its variety and diversity in this country and around the world. For our own Anglican communion, for Justin Welby as he seeks to give leadership. We pray for this diocese, for our bishops, Nicholas, Karen, Andrew. We pray for the churches of this city, and particularly our friends in the Methodist and United Reformed churches, and for the ministry of St Thomas's in the city centre. We pray, Lord God, for all your people in testing times. We pray for a world scarred by rivalries and tension and conflict. We pray for victims of war, for those who are refugees, for those who suffer through injustice or oppression. And we ask your blessing, Lord God, on relief agencies and peacemakers and all who strive for the common good. We pray, Lord God, for all who suffer in this current pandemic. We pray for those who are ill, for those who have had so much of what they enjoy in life taken away, for those who have lost their livelihoods, for those who are suffering in poverty or financial uncertainty, for those who are isolated. We pray, Lord God, for healing in every way. We pray, Lord God, for all who are ill, for those known to us who are in any sickness or adversity at this time. We pray for those who live in care homes, for those who are in hospital, and for those who mourn.
Lord of the Church, hear our prayer and make us one in heart and mind to serve you with joy forever. Amen. We now pray together in the words of the Lord's Prayer. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power and the glory, for ever and ever. Amen. Before we sing our final hymn, I'm going to give two notices. The first is to say that this afternoon Holy Communion will be celebrated in St Thomas's at four o'clock using all the preventative and safety measures that we're becoming familiar with, but uh, all are welcome to that service this afternoon. And secondly, I'm delighted to announce publicly that Uta Schwarting, our wonderful um, acting organist, has now been formally made organist at St Thomas's. So we're delighted that um, she has won that post for herself. We're delighted that she will be able to use her many gifts and talents to enhance and take forward the musical offering of this church. She is a truly talented person. She's worked with amazing imagination over the last few months. And I'm very much hoping that it won't be long before she can begin to play on the uh, George III organ that lives in St Thomas's church. So delighted to announce that Uta has won this post and we all congratulate her and give her our love and blessings. We now sing our final hymn, We Have a Gospel to Proclaim.
Lord bless you and watch over you. The Lord make his face shine upon you and be gracious to you. The Lord look kindly on you and give you his peace. And the blessing of God Almighty, the Father, the Son and the Holy Spirit be among you and remain with you always. Amen.